Easter Sunday, 1992, a California millionaire and his family are murdered. The plan was to take out the entire family. It was a pure out and out assassination of three beautiful people. Leaving behind an only son who becomes the prime suspect. It's like Homicide 101, who's gonna benefit from these people's deaths? It all came back to Dana. But this is no open and shut case. As it turned out, he had the perfect alibi. On California's northern coast, about 70 miles south of San Francisco, lie the Pajaro Dunes. Along the beach are dozens of homes with dramatic views of the Pacific Ocean. One of them belonged to 59-year-old Dale Ewell, a self-made millionaire who owned an airplane dealership in Fresno. He liked to escape to the coast with his family on weekends and holidays. It was a great place for relaxation, great place for uh, writing poetry, if you did such a thing, or for thinking about life. In April 1992, Dale spent Easter weekend at the beach with his wife of 30 years, Glee Ewell, and their two children, 24-year-old daughter Tiffany and 21-year-old son Dana. Two days later, on Tuesday, April 21st, a house cleaning crew arrived at the Ewell family home in Fresno. The crew leader was Rosie Avidia, who had worked for the Ewells for the past dozen years. They were very nice people. They were very nice. I liked working with them. As she walked up to the front door, she saw a neighbor waiting in the front yard. He said he had just gotten a long distance call from Dana Ewell who was a senior at Santa Clara University, near San Jose, more than 200 miles away. She told me, well, Dana called me and said, his parents, they don't answer the phone. And I told him, well, I think they're not here. The newspapers are here outside. Rosie was surprised that none of the Ewells seemed to be around that morning. As she let the crew in, she noticed something strange. The security system had been disarmed, and it appeared the place had been ransacked. There was a stereo, some clothes, let him look like it was a, a robbery. So we went through the kitchen, and then she was Tiffany in the floor. The 24-year-old had been shot in the back of the head and was lying face down in a pool of blood. Rosie and the others quickly left the house and called 911. When the police arrived, they found Tiffany was not alone. Another body was in a nearby hallway. Going into that hallway from the garage was uh, another deceased person turned out to be Dale Yule. He too had been shot in the back of the head. Near his body was a rolled up newspaper dated April 19th, Easter Sunday. Then police found a third body in an office off the hallway. 57-year-old Glee Ewell, Dale's wife. She had been shot multiple times, it appeared. She was with one of her hands draped up over her head like she was trying to shield herself. We believed that um, she had seen Tiffany get shot and started running. Investigators found no sign of forced entry, no suspicious fingerprints, and no other trace evidence. And while there were all the superficial indications of a burglary, something about the crime scene struck detectives as strange. I was a burglary detective prior to being a homicide detective, and I've never seen a house to this degree uh, of ransack, and uh, it was a kind of an overkill. There were sheets, bed sheets set out. On the sheets were things like cassette tapes, uh, things of very little value. The police concluded the burglary had been staged, an attempt by the killer or killers to hide the actual motive. But why would the Ewells be targeted for a professional hit? 
Detectives hope to find some answers from the sole survivor of the family, Dana Ewell. After being contacted at school by investigators, the 21-year-old flew to Fresno that afternoon for an interview. It was a sympathetic, what I call a sympathetic interview. It was like, who would do this and why would someone do this to your family? During the taped interview, Ewell sat stiffly in his chair, displaying little emotion, matter-of-factly answering questions. I still don't know how any of this happened or how they might family died or anything of that nature. It's just they're dead, it's all right. Detective John Sousa was struck by Ewell's composure. It was amazing, his demeanor and lack of any, any sorrow of any sort, um, um, just strictly business. Do you know of any reason why anybody would want your family dead? Nothing That attitude continued the next day when Fresno detectives walked Ewell through the crime scene. He casually pointed out that his father's Browning 9mm gun was missing. The empty gun bag and ammunition were laid out in his parents' bedroom. The theft of the gun seemed to fit the murder. The victims had been shot with 9mm bullets. But Dana Ewell didn't seem to be affected by his family's violent end. He literally stepped right, right where his mom had died, and it did not faze him a bit. The only things that concerned him was we were taken out of his house, and he wanted an itemized list. At first, the detective tried to rationalize Ewell's odd behavior. I said, well, you could be in shock. Everyone's different. But this guy here was by far the most unusual person I've ever met in 28 years. Fellow investigator Chris Curtis was immediately suspicious. When Dana came and walked through the, uh, the crime scene, I said, that kid's dirty. His whole attitude, you could just tell this kid's dirty for some reason. The detectives would soon discover that Dana Ewell had millions of reasons to murder his wealthy father and the rest of his family. But he also had something else, an airtight alibi. In April 1992, the city of Fresno, California was shocked by a triple murder in the quiet, affluent neighborhood of Sunnyside. Millionaire Dale Ewell, his wife Glee, and their daughter Tiffany were found shot to death in their home. They were survived by the family's only son, Dina. This was a big event for the city of Fresno. The wealth of the people, they were very well known. Police and family members believed the Ewells had been ambushed early Easter Sunday evening when they returned from a weekend at their beach house. It was a pure out and out assassination of three beautiful people. The question was who had killed the Ewells and why? Investigators began looking into the family background for clues. What they found was an American success story with what appeared to be a shocking twist. Dale Ewell grew up on a farm in northeastern Ohio, the second oldest of five children. Dale loved flying and joined the Air Force to become a pilot. While stationed in Phoenix, Arizona, he met and began dating Glee Mitchell, a vivacious college student from Chicago. Everybody liked her. She was the most likable person I think I ever met. Dale and Glee married in 1961 and settled in Fresno, California. Dale acquired a small airplane dealership and quickly built a fortune. He was a great salesman. He'd barnstorm into farmers' fields and sell them on the, the 200 mile an hour and the wind in your face and the glamour of it. He sold a lot of airplanes. He was making as much as $30,000 per airplane in the 1960s. Dale Ewell was a shrewd, tough businessman. He bought hundreds of acres of farmland in the Fresno area and also invested in stocks and bonds. His wife, Glee, was active in the community, doing public service and charity work. She doted on her two children, Tiffany, born in 1967, and Dana, born in 1971. They were always 
always happy and always talking to each other and no fights, no nothing. Not even with Dana and, the, and Tiffany. Both children attended Fresno's private Catholic high school, San Joaquin Memorial. Michael Poindexter was Dana Ewell's best friend. I went to his house quite a bit. His parents were really nice. His mom was one of the nicest people I ever knew. Dana was a straight-A student, but tended to flaunt his family's wealth. He'd wear expensive suits and sometimes take a limo to school. To Dana, it seemed money and image were everything. He was Mr. Businessman. All he wanted to do was, you know, become some, you know, world-famous billionaire tycoon. He let you know that right away. When he graduated, Dana Ewell was named in the yearbook as most likely to succeed. But the teenager was not inclined to follow in the footsteps of his hard-working father. Poindexter says that his friend was less interested in striving for success than he was in cold, hard cash. He was the greediest person I've ever met in my life. I'm in business, I meet a lot of greedy people, and he tops them all. On April 25th, 1992, six days after the murders, a memorial service was held for the Ewell family. Dale Ewell's distraught brothers were shocked by their nephew's behavior. The funeral, he acted like he was a host of a social event, laughing, very inappropriate, very gross. In fact, Dana seemed not to be mourning at all. The day after the services, uh, Dana grabbed a keg of beer and a lot of friends and a boat and went out and partied. Dale Ewell's brothers brought their concerns to Fresno Police Detective John Souza. They reported that Dana had pestered them about the family will and his inheritance. At the time of their deaths, Dale and Glee Ewell's net worth stood at just under $8 million. 48 hours after his family was found murdered, Dana wanted to know about the money. My brother Ben had writ read the will. He said, well, it looks like you get the full interest at 25, when he was only 21 then. You get half the estate at 30 and the other half at 35. And Dana became just belligerent. Dana, according to one of his brothers, slammed his fist on the table and said, how could my father do this to me? It bothered them that they even suspected their nephew. Uh, but it, they, they told us, you need to look at him, and not only look at him once, you better look at him twice. Fresno police were now becoming increasingly suspicious that Dana Ewell might have had something to do with his family's murder. But when they checked out his alibi, they hit a brick wall. The day the bodies were discovered, Ewell told investigators he'd been with his family Easter weekend at their beach house. That Saturday night, he said, his girlfriend and her parents had joined them for dinner. The next day, he said goodbye to his family. Sunday morning, we, we, I played tennis with my dad, and we had lunch. We all took a walk on the beach. I was the first one to leave, and uh, my mother and sister and father were all there, and we all, you know, hugged and said, kissed and said, okay, we'll see each other in two weeks. On Sunday afternoon, Ewell said, he drove to his girlfriend's home in Morgan Hill, about an hour east, and spent the evening with her family. He said around 9 p.m. he and his girlfriend decided to head back to Santa Clara University, where they were both students. We looked at each other and said, we better get going. We got that stuff to do. And so we, we got in my car and drove up to school. Ewell's girlfriend backed up his story, as did her father, who happened to be an FBI agent. I can't imagine a more superb alibi if I run into some kind of trouble, then I, in fact I've been with an FBI agent during the commission of the crime. The months after the murders, the police followed a variety of leads. But when nothing panned out, they turned their attention back to Dana Ewell. Those leads were investigated to the nth degree and everything kept coming back to, you know, it's like Homicide 101. Who's going to benefit from these people's deaths? It all came back to Dana. 
police began to wonder if Ewell might have planned the murders, but then found someone else to carry them out. Detective John Souza came across some articles published in the previous two years in which Dana passed himself off as a teen mogul who made millions playing the stock market and selling airplanes. These bold lies, based on his father's life, may have upset and embarrassed his parents. It's believed that Dale may have cut Dana off after these articles came out. Dale would not stand for something like that. We're wondering if that was a time that Dale told Dana, I'll help you through school, which is one more semester than you're on your own. Police wondered whether Ewell may have believed that by killing his family, he would gain his inheritance immediately. Unaware that his father's will called for the money to be given to him over the course of a decade, Detective Sousa traveled to Santa Clara University, where Dana Ewell was a senior, and began asking questions around campus. Once they canvassed the college, they started to hear the name of Joel Radovich whenever they brought up the name of Dana Ewell. Joel Radovich had graduated the previous December. The two had lived in the same dorm, and though they were described as close friends, they made an unlikely pair. It couldn't be more different. Dana was an outgoing, crisply dressed professional. Joel was a sort of unkempt loner. There was something about him that was damaged goods. Radovich was now unemployed and living at his parents' house in the Los Angeles suburb of West Hills. In May 1992, detectives called and requested an interview. He agreed to meet them at a nearby Holiday Inn. In a taped conversation, Radovich claimed he didn't know Dana Ewell very well. We weren't really tight, but we were just friends. We liked to kick it together. Other than school, we didn't really communicate outside of school. The student insisted that when the murders occurred on Easter Sunday, he was at an auto body shop near his home, where he often hung out. We were um, here watching TV, um, moving cars and out. So I was there probably most of the day. But what time did you go home? 11. 11-ish. Police looked into his alibi and discovered it didn't check out. The owner of the auto body shop didn't remember seeing Joel that night. After the murders, Dana Ewell dropped out of school and moved back home to Fresno. Within a few weeks, he had stopped talking to police. To keep an eye on him, John Souza set up surveillance outside the home. Soon, Joel Radovich was seen coming and going. In fact, it appeared he had moved in. The pair was spotted going to several banks. On one occasion, Dana came out. He had what appeared to be possibly a check. Uh, and uh, Dana kind of jumping up in the air and clicking his heels like he had just hit the lotto. In August 1992, Investigators served dozens of warrants for the Ewell banking records. One account contained more than $400,000, money that was supposed to be going toward the care of Dana's grandmother, who was in a California nursing home. Because he was the sole family survivor, Dana was able to appoint himself trustee of the account. And he's um, um, taking money out of the account like, like there was no end. He fairly quickly bought a new airplane for about $150,000. But more interesting to the investigators was the money that he lavished on Joel Radovich. Eventually, there were quite a few items that linked these two together financially. Including flight lessons for Radovich, as well as a pager and health insurance, all paid for by Dana Ewell. That November, investigators for the first time stated publicly that Dana Ewell could not be ruled out as a suspect in the murder of his family. Through his lawyer, Ewell declared his innocence and said he was being made a scapegoat. But the publicity seemed to have an effect on Ewell and his friend. Dana Ewell and Joel Radovich seemed to get a clue and physically stay apart. 
Radovsich dropped out of sight until February 1993, when investigators learned he was back in the L.A. area and began trailing him once again. He didn't seem to have any real direction. He seemed to simply wander greater Los Angeles. Well, Joel was a nomad. He was a transient. He would do all his communications on pay phones. He liked phone banks at 7-Elevens. Undercover police began to listen in on his conversations by pretending to use the phone next to his. In one call, he was heard saying, bring your parents and sister, we'll have a party. Detective Sousa wondered if this was a cold-hearted reference to the Yules. In another call, he said he wanted money. He um, was overheard saying, I want a quarter of me and I want it now. I want to go around the world. Those suspicious statements prompted Sousa to secure warrants to track the calls made by Radovsich. The detective found that virtually all of the calls were going to pay phones in Santa Clara, where Dana Ewell was now back at school. To see if Ewell was in turn contacting Radovsich, police got a warrant to make a clone of Joel's pager. Now every time Joel got paged, so would Detective Sousa. In May, Sousa and his partner, Chris Curtis, tested out their new surveillance tool. They visited Dana in his dorm room and deliberately provoked him. He starts to shut the door. I said, by the way, we think Joel Radovich killed your family. He looked like somebody punched him in the gut. He didn't turn white, he turned transparent. A short time later, they saw Ewell storming out of the dorm. Then, Sousa's clone pager went off. Ewell was paging Joel Radovsich from Santa Clara. Police traced the number on the pager to a nearby payphone. They went to the location, and there, in a darkened parking lot, was Dana Ewell at the phone. So, after we told him at his dorm that Joel Radovich was responsible for killing his parents, he makes a page to him. I mean, again, you don't have to be a rocket scientist. The police continued their surveillance and documented a number of conversations that they found incriminating. Statements like, well, you never know what they hold. You know evidence. Don't talk to them. I'm worried. Can they arrest me? I mean, why, why do you make those statements unless you're guilty? The phone surveillance would give police their biggest break on June 8th. 1993. That day, undercover officers overheard Radovsich requesting that a package be delivered to a man named Jack Ponce. I'm going, who is Jack Ponce? His name would never been in our investigation. Ponce, it turned out, was a friend of Joel's older brother. They had all attended the same high school in West Hills. In October, Detective Souza interviewed Ponce. The 25-year-old repeatedly denied knowing anything. But police kept up the pressure, interviewing him several times in the following months. Finally, in February 1994, Ponce admitted that he had once owned a 9mm gun, an 18-9 assault rifle, which he claimed had later been stolen. And that was big news. That then started to tie everything together. The Ewell family had all been shot with 9mm rounds. The information about the AT-9 was exactly what Alan Boudreau, a firearms expert with the Fresno County Sheriff's Department, needed. Boudreau had been trying for more than a year to determine what make of weapon had been used in the triple murder. All he had to go on were five 9mm bullets. They were very distinctly marked in a very odd way. And it suggested to me that those bullets had been fired through a weapon that had been modified, perhaps, with a silencer. Detectives had also discovered that Radovsich had ordered books on how to make homemade silencers. And in those books, it showed drilling holes through the barrel, which is called porting. And so I tried that and immediately obtained marks like those on the murder bullets, the magic marks, if you will. But it wasn't until Boudreau began working with an AT-9 like Jack Ponce's weapon that he was able to produce markings identical to those on the murder bullets. 
With this hard ballistics evidence, the investigative puzzle finally came together. In early 1995, the investigators constructed a timeline. At 100 feet long, it stretched nearly the entire length of their office hallway. The timeline supported their theory that Dana Ewell had hired Joel Radovich to kill his parents in return for a share of his inheritance money. Jack Ponce, they believed, had supplied the murder weapon. Once we put it on paper on this timeline, it was amazing to see how everything fit together. We color-coded everything, surveillances, pages were a specific color, phone calls, financial transactions. From the timeline, they drafted a 47-page document in support of arrest. The DA gave the go-ahead, and with that, Fresno police launched Operation Three Stooges. They arrested Joel Radovich, then Jack Ponce. Finally, on March 4, 1995, after a three-year investigation, police took Dana Ewell into custody. All three suspects were charged with first-degree murder. In early March 1995, after a three-year investigation, 24-year-old Dana Ewell of Fresno, California, was charged in the murder of his father, Dale, his mother, Glee, and his sister, Tiffany. Ewell was accused of masterminding the murder plot and hiring a college classmate, 24-year-old Joel Radovich, to carry it out. A friend of Radovich's, Jack Pons, was also charged with murder for supplying the 9mm weapon used in the killings. Pons quickly cut a deal with authorities. He sat down with Fresno detectives and gave a complete confession. Jack Pons brought forth two pieces of information. One that Joel had confessed to him, giving him details of the murders, which only the murderer would know, and two, that he knew where the barrel of the murder weapon was. Pons led police to a vacant lot in the Los Angeles suburb of Reseda. We started digging around, and there was the barrel. Barrel to the gun. That's basically what broke the whole case. Firearms expert Alan Boudreau cleaned up the barrel, test-fired it, and compared the bullets with those recovered from the victims. My opinion was that, that those bullets from the murder came down that barrel dug up from the earth. Jack Pons admitted to purchasing the weapon. Police believed he bought it so it couldn't be traced to Radovich. Pons also said he saw Radovich build a silencer in his mother's garage using the how-to handbooks Radovich had ordered. But Ponce denied knowing the gun would be used in a triple murder. Were you aware when you bought the gun of what it was to be used for? No, never. I never knew that um, he was going to do anything like that with it. Ponce said that after the murders, Radovich told him everything as they sat together one day at Malibu Beach. Ponce described how Radovich drew a picture of the layout of the Ewell house in the sand and told him about the killings. He just said that uh, the, the mother was facing him. So uh, he shot her more times than once. Um, and then he said, uh, I believe he shot the daughter once when she turned a corner in, in the back of her head. And then uh, he waited and, and shot the dad. Ponce agreed to tell his story in court in exchange for immunity. Ewell and Radovich were ordered held without bail. Prosecutors said they would seek the death penalty for both defendants. Ewell's inherited assets were frozen by the court. That December, with Ewell no longer able to afford his private defense attorney, the court named public defender Peter Jones to represent him. He denied being involved in any way. Immediately, there was a case of guilt by association that was being put together by the prosecution. A local defense attorney, Ernest Kinney, joined the high-profile case for free. Ewell's co-defendant, Joel Radovich, was represented by Philip Cherney. Cherney quickly found himself at odds with the Ewell defense team. He felt the evidence in the case was too strong to fight for acquittal. His goal was to avoid the death penalty. 
I was seeking to mitigate the crime and to seek a life sentence for my client, I believe the Ewell uh, defense was very much complete denial. After more than two years of pretrial wrangling, the murder trial of Dana Ewell and Joel Radovich finally got underway in Fresno County Superior Court in December 1997. Prosecutor James Opliger told the jury that the killings were carefully planned by Dana Ewell in order to take over the family fortune. The crime was clearly an orchestrated hit. The plan was to take out the entire family. You then say, why? Who benefits? The heir benefits. The crime scene in that sense pointed towards Dana. Opliger said inside information provided by Dana Ewell helped Joel Radovich commit the crime. Not only was the alarm system at the family home disarmed, but the ammunition used in the killing came from inside the house, from a box in Dale Ewell's nightstand. By using these bullets, Opliger argued, the defendants hoped to fool police into thinking burglars had stolen Dale Ewell's gun and turned it on the family. It was the state's star witness, Jack Ponce, who tied the prosecution's case together. He testified about how he supplied and then disposed of the murder weapon and about hearing Joel's confession. Jack Ponce's story fit like a glove. The defense tried to rebut Ponce's testimony by calling his guilt into question. They introduced a theory that Ponce and Radovich had gone to the Ewell home together to burglarize it, and that Ponce, who was an experienced marksman, committed the murders when the Ewells arrived home. Radovich couldn't shoot at all. Dana couldn't shoot at all. Ponce was a dead crack shot. And I think he killed him. The prosecution countered by saying that their surveillance evidence was proof that Ewell and Radovich were the true conspirators. The communication shows connection, and then the surreptitious nature, this cloak and dagger type of operation that they were running, they've got something to hide. The defense claimed Ewell had been advised by his lawyer at the time to use pay funds because he was under investigation. When you're under suspicion and uh, you're uh, being investigated, and, uh, and of course Dana's position is I'm being wrongfully investigated, you're going to take on a posture of avoiding police. But there were also the financial links between the two. Financial rewards passing from Mr. Ewell, significant financial rewards, can't be underestimated how important that was. Joel Radovich had received close to $100,000 in the year following the murders. Money, the prosecution said, that was payment for the killings. Ewell's lawyer says his client was just helping out a friend. You're talking peanuts. The money and the stuff, we're talking a hundred grand out of five million peanuts for a good friend. But the prosecution had witnesses who said it wasn't in Ewell's nature to be so generous, including high school friend Michael Poindexter. Poindexter also told the court how shocked he was when he visited Ewell at his home about a week after the murders. I walked in there and he offered to give me a tour. And they hadn't cleaned up yet. And there were still blood splatters on the wall. The state presented more than 90 witnesses over the course of several months. In the end, prosecutor James Opliger felt he had proven that Dana Ewell had his family murdered for money. Dana Yule, he's arrogant, greedy, and immoral. You cannot have a more cold-blooded or evil motive for killing than this. On April 28, 1998, the triple murder trial of Dana Ewell and Joel Radovich ended in Fresno, California. After four months of testimony, the jury of seven men and five women started their deliberations with no clear consensus. About a day and a half, just uh, everybody just kind of saying what they had to say, saying what they couldn't say. People were arguing more about whether Joel could have had anything to do with it than Dana. The jury was overwhelmed by the hundreds of pieces of evidence. To help them sort out the facts, they devised their own timeline of the case. 
We followed the money. It was pretty obvious to see money came out, bills were paid. Those things started to tie together very succinctly. Telephone calls, locations, the timeline drew all the facts together, drew, drew a very good picture of what took place, and gave everyone an opportunity to make their own decision about it. Jurors wholeheartedly accepted the prosecution's firearms evidence, which showed that the murder bullets were fired from the weapons supplied by Jack Ponce. I don't think there was any doubt about the weapon and, and the silencer, the bullets. But the jury also felt Ponce himself was lying and may have been more involved with the murders than he let on. Jurors tossed out Ponce's testimony and didn't use it in their deliberations. For most of the jury, it was the timeline that helped clear up any lingering doubts. But there was one whole dot, a juror who remained unsure of Dana Ewell's guilt until he reviewed the phone surveillance a final time. You could kind of kind of see him go down in his chair and say, yep, and he changed. After 11 days of deliberations, the jury found Dana Ewell and Joel Radovich guilty of first-degree murder in the killings of Dale, Glee, and Tiffany Ewell. Lead investigator John Souza wept at the verdict. He'd been on the case from the beginning for six years and was overwhelmed by conflicting emotions. Obviously, elated to the fact that found them guilty. But very sad because my first vision was Tiffany Yule. Um, that she, um, she had the misfortune of her brother as she had. After finding Ewell and Radovic guilty, the jury had to decide if they should be sentenced to death. During the trial, Ewell's attorneys had strongly proclaimed their client's innocence. The attorney for Joel Radovic, Philip Cherney, had been more concerned about saving his client's life. Now in the sentencing phase, he presented powerful testimony about Joel's psychological problems. This is a very damaged person. He was unable to connect with anyone emotionally on any sort of mature level. Cherney said Radovich suffered from a schizoid personality disorder caused by an emotionally abusive father. Joel is someone who I think was deeply hurt early on in his life and never recovered from it. The Radovich's parish priest was Father Chris Ponette he testified that for many years, he was deeply concerned for Joel and his six brothers and sisters. I began to perceive as a sense of anger and frustration and, and violence that the children were experiencing at home. That was a concern for me for all the rest of my years. Father Ponette told the court about meeting with Radovich after he was found guilty. He accepted that he was guilty. He accepted that he participated, and he accepted that um, this has caused pain, and he was sorrowful for that, and he apologized for that. For three days, the jury struggled over the sentence. Finally, after voting 10 to 2 for the death penalty for Joel Radovich and 11 to 1 for Ewell, they were forced to tell Judge Frank Creed that they could not reach a unanimous decision for either defendant. Under California law, this meant the death penalty could not be imposed. On July 20th, 1998, Judge Creed handed down the harshest sentence he could for both convicted murderers. It is uh, the judgment of this court that you be committed to a California state prison uh, for the rest of your life without possibility of parole. At his sentencing, Dana Ewell spoke out publicly for the first time. He read a statement professing his innocence and declaring a deep love for his family. I love my family with all my heart and soul. We were so very close and happy and content. I only wish that I could get up and walk away from here and that my mother and my father and my sister would be waiting for me and we could, we could be together again forever. Dana Ewell and Joel Radovich are each serving three consecutive life sentences. 
Ewell is doing his time in California's Corcoran prison, which houses some of the state's most violent criminals. He works prison jobs, like clearing tables in the cafeteria, stripped of all his rights to any family inheritance. Danny Ewell had many gifts. He was intelligent, he had his family, he was secure, all of those things which apparently he threw away. The worst of crimes, killing your own family for financial gain. He did such a dastardly thing. He changed so many lives. He took so many lives.